Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the next 18 minutes, I'm going to um, give you all the secrets about getting into space if you're broke, or at least uh, somewhat broke, because um, when I met Peter two and a half years ago, we had a common dream about going into space based on dreams and ideas and what we've been doing in the past. Um, and you might ask why we want to do that. And I think it's just because sometimes in life, uh, certain opportunities just appears and you just simply have to, 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 to grab it. Otherwise, you're going to regret it the rest of your life. And uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we spoke for about 10 minutes and then we decided to do this and we have been doing this full time for the last two and a half years. See, this is the view that uh, we would like to have in our own uh, home-built spacecraft. And this is, uh, this is the ride itself. It's about a three-minute fast ride into space. But it's not as much the ride itself as, as you know, going there, building this, and, and, do, you know, and trying to overcome the challenges of doing this project. Um, you know, but when you sit down two persons and you want to start up a, a human spaceflight program, you need to figure out what do you need? Um, <clears throat> how do you actually start doing this? Um, and the first thing you need actually is, you know, you need, you need to... Is this true? Yeah. Well, you need, you, need to, you need to have the dream. You need to want to do this. But second, you need to be more practical about it. And then you need a brand. You need a name in some way that's going to fool people a bit about what you're doing so, that, so you can kind of, you know, suddenly surprise them with what you're doing. I'm not a graphical designer at all. I know there's uh, some great graphical designers in here, so you have to bear with me. But this is the, the logo we made. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because it contains the essence of the project. Um, I deliberately made it as, you know, inspired by a royal seal of some kind because it should be as far as way possible as the, the normal space logo. It's always planets and, and stars and, and, and rockets. Well, there is a small rocket, but it, it, it's kind of concealed in there. And then we, we, we pick a name that was kind of, uh, you know, related to where we are. Uh, it didn't say Denmark because at that point Denmark was kind of, you know, not very popular out there. So Copenhagen was more, uh, you know, it was a more cool name. And suborbital, you know, refers to the kind of space flight we're doing, which is just like the short trip going up and down. And then these royal seals, they always have Latin in them. And uh, I know that nobody knows how to read Latin these days, so I just made some stuff up, so, which kind of, uh, <laughs> except for this at Astra here, which means to the stars. But because Peter and I sat down and, 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 and soon had to realize that there's no way we're going to come up with a sound business plan we could turn into anybody giving us money for this project and show safety records, which is really good. Uh, so we, we, we made it uh, non lucra, which means, it's supposed to mean um, um, an open, um, no, yeah, non-profit. Um, and then... <clears throat> We, we thought, well, this, this, is a, this is a great thing to do. I mean, we, there's, there's a lot of things to share with people. So we made it open source, and this is what this uh, Latin part down here is supposed to mean as well. Um, and by doing it open sourced and a non-profit project, we, we soon realized that people came to us with ideas. They came with us, you know... With, with a bit of financial support, and it kind of spread around the world. Uh, instead of just holding it tight to your body about, you know, what are you doing here, you, you kind of show, the, show it to the world. People want to get along on the ride, and it's been a great thing for this project. Um, but besides, you know, having a logo, you have to build a space rocket. It's very sophisticated, so you need the tools as well. And, of course, you need the anvil, you need the hammer, the screwdriver, an angle grinder, a lathe, and a welding tool. And if you have this, you can build the space rocket. Then you're all good to go. And we have all of this. Well, we, we, <clears throat> we, get, uh, we get approached all the time by nuclear scientists and uh, astrophysicists, but, you know, it's basically about 95%, you know, blacksmith work. You need to be able to produce this stuff here. We work with ordinary simple materials because we, we don't need to optimize it in the same way like the pro guys are doing because that's based on 
uh, profit in a certain way, mass to weight ratio into space and all this stuff. But, you know, we don't care about that. As long as this rocket can get us into space, it's fine. It's, it's made of stuff bought in uh, the supermarket or in the local plumbing shop on just in regular... <clears throat> just regular materials. A normal day goes by that Peter and I meet. Um, I want to say as well, we have a group of about 20 people helping us in the spare time. But general, it's Peter and I full time here. We meet in the morning, we discuss, we debate, we kind of see who has the best scientific argument based on what we know of math, physics, and chemistry. And then we simply go out and build the stuff. This, you, 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 you just have to you know, go out there and... Uh, and, and build it, not all this talk and all this sketching. Build the hardware. <clears throat> and like any other project, you need to go through a sound development process. It doesn't really matter if it's a space rocket or a, a cell phone or whatever, or a car. You need to you know, take steps. You need to learn from small experiments and go further up. I like this picture here of Peter looking at one of his engines, uh, a smaller one. Uh, a new one. This one actually exploded last Friday, but that was a great experience as well. Uh, but it's kind of dark, but this is the, the rocket we, was, we are, we are going to be using, uh, try to use again uh, the coming June, which is the biggest uh, hybrid rocket engine built by amateurs in the world. It has a thrust at about seven tons. Um, it might not say anything to you, but that's, it's a lot. Um, well, that's... that's you, there's going to be a payload here. A payload means that you're going to send something into space. It could be a satellite, it could be, you know, um, the Hubble telescope, or it, for us it's a spacecraft containing one person. And you might do something daring, but it, of course it should never be foolish. So, you know, we're going to have this, uh, this dummy here, which is um, sponsored by a guy. Um, so, 70 kilograms, the same size as us, so the spacecraft is tailored to fly this dummy as many times as we see fit uh, before we replace him with ourselves. Um, this is not the dummy, but this is actually me inside the spacecraft. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that is, uh, you know, kind of radical in the sense uh, is that we had, to, we had to change the approach that one person is inside a spacecraft. Um, because we're not really doing anything new that the Russians or the U.S. didn't do way back in the 50s and the 60s. But, you know, normally you would have a person lying on their back because when you're lying on your back, you're able to withstand the biggest G-forces that uh, you get when you are ascending and descending. But we didn't really have the ability to control and building hardware with a diameter of two meters, so we have to get it much smaller. And also, you know, if we could make it a size where you just take a two-meter standard plate and just you know, bend it around to make tubes, it would be much cheaper. And we figure out that, so if you took a two-meter tube and just bend it around, it, was just, it would just fit that if you were standing inside the rocket instead, kind of half, set, half sitting, half standing. And then you are able to get this great view, which is a top dome. It's a three-centimeter acrylic dome, and you can just have a look you know, outside and over the entire world. And people, you know, this is one of the typical examples. People told us, well, there's no way you can do that because you need to be lying on your back. And we were asking, like, why? And it's the typical answer is because that is what you normally do. Um, but we are kind of just looking into it because we know this rocket accelerates with about four to five Gs. And, and if you talk to any uh, jet pilot, uh, they would just say, well, that is nothing. Um, so, of course, well, you need to test this. And also, what does 4 to 5 Gs actually feels like? That would be interesting to know. And this is where you go if you want to test stuff like this um, for the pro guys. This centrifuge here at NASA can take you up to about 20 Gs, and you can see what is your limits and what is your tolerances. And so, you know, it would be great to test yourself inside this. Well, Peter and I, we don't have the contact specifically for this place, nor do we have the money. So you have to look around you, actually, where do you go? So we go in Tivoli Garden <laughs> in Copenhagen to, uh, to test. And you know, <laughs> funny enough, this machine actually provides the exact same G-forces as our rocket. So we, uh, with an exchange of a submarine ride, we, because we have a submarine as well, uh, we, we borrowed this machine for half a day. Uh, much fun. I've, 
I felt sick for days after, but it was uh, it was great experience. And it also tells you, you know, anybody can go and get four to five Gs at any time. You know, this is not built for just specific people. Anybody can do this. So um, you shouldn't be, you know, looking at you know at your project no matter what it is. Is what is the normal limitations? You just forget about it and just look. What do we need and what can we actually do? I like this picture here. This is uh, where Peter and I meet. It, the, the development, uh, the project is is is, um, is divided in two sections. Actually, Peter is responsible for making the rocket engine. I'm responsible for the spacecraft uh, due to our, our backgrounds. And this is where the two parts meet, and there's a bit of discussion about this. But um, it was just before we had to get ready to go into sea and launch this. Um, the parachutes here, the reason why I want to show you the parachute, because I don't want to go into all the details, is that this kind of indicates a certain way we work. Um, I tried to get hold of parachutes for a long time. They might be very expensive, but uh, you know, I talked to a lot of companies, and they were always like, "Yeah, can we talk to the uh, your parachute recovery department?" And I was like, "Well, you got him on the phone," and uh, <laughs> and, and 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 they told me, "You know, can you can you guarantee me uh, that our parachutes is not going to show up in, in a picture with with fire in it or doing a crash?" And I was like, "Nope." Absolutely not. There's no guarantees here because this is about testing and trying out. And then nobody wants to sell us parachutes because they know each other's products. And if somebody else's products is shown suddenly with fire in it, it's very bad for business. So we have to make them ourselves. And I just got a contact to a guy called CERN, and he's very good at sewing stuff, working with fabrics. And I, and I said, CERN, we need parachutes. Two months. We don't have them. We have the rocket and the, the spacecraft. We need parachutes. And he was like, well... I have no idea how to work parachutes. And I said, great, neither do I, but let's find out. And that's kind of the approach to it, you know. I would rather any day work with some guy telling me, you know, I have no idea how to do this, but let's find out. Instead of the usual answer is you get hold of a parachute guy, which I did, and they're saying, I know all about parachutes, and I'm telling you it can't be done. This is, you know, the typical thing. So... The same with the heat shield. I have an engineer, he did the heat shield for the spacecraft, and he said, I had no idea how to do it. And I said, I don't either. Just, just find out, and then you do it. You create it. You have to start somewhere. And I guess even the pro parachutes guy, they needed to start somewhere as well, you know, and, and figure out what to do. And, and if it fails, it fails. Then you learn a lot, and then you, you, you redo it. This is stacking of the rocket uh, last summer. Um, Peter checking stuff on the fins, and I'm looking very happy. I don't know why this was a terrible time, actually, trying to pull the spacecraft on top of the rocket. <clears throat> but um, the th yeah, and here's a view of the dummy. This is about, the rocket is about 10 meters high, so you have a great view. Um, and it will be even better when you get into space. See, the thing is, uh, you can't really get around authorities and the government. And when you call somebody and say, hey, I need to um, work something out, I'm doing a homemade space rocket, there's a bit of silence for a while. And then, you know, <clears throat> I think the more out of proportion the project is, the more goodwill you actually get. And we also have a good benefit that, you know, if you take, for instance, the Virgin Galactic project, uh, Richard Branson, Bert Rutan. Bert Rutan is one of my, he's a hero to me. But, you know, if you know the project, you know they're starting with an airplane, from 70 kilometers height, and, and then you're going from there. And if we were doing air, airplanes like they do, or if we were doing a fast cars, then we, we would have been, you know, there would have been so much law about, so many standards and requirements we have to deal with. But in the, in the law books, there's nothing about the standards of a homemade space rocket. So we have completely free hands to do whatever we want <laughs> and set our own standards, and this is great. But it also gives us a responsibility to kind of, you know, you know, treat this right so we don't set the, the wrong way to do it in the future for other guys. Because I hope everybody here is ready to do their own space rocket after this speech here. Um, and we also realized that Danish law basically stops 20 nautical miles outside of, the, of, of land. So uh, instead of dealing with too many authorities, we decided to go into sea. So uh, we had to build six months before this uh, 
10 tons uh, catamaran here, which is the launch tower for the rocket. And, and it, again, you know, it, we've got a military test area in the Baltic Sea, and it was given to us by some authorities, and they are very happy to help us. And I can only say that we have only met happy faces, and, and I'm very, you know, I'm, th these guys are great working with. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, last, uh, I think it was in September, we tried to launch this thing into the, in, into the sky. And it was, a, it was a, you know, it was, a, it was difficult times, you know, three months of incredible hard work, no sleep at all, also planning, you know, 30, 40 people at sea. We had different Navy ships. You have to close the airspace from all Northern Europe going down and, you know, get, get that working as well. And also the Baltic Sea, you have to cut off, you know, and it's incredible what you can get away with as an amateur guy, you're not trying to get it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and also, you know, you, we were waiting at Bonholm for a week and it was, you know, everybody was getting a bit annoyed of each other and we had to wait for good weather and suddenly there was press from, from all over the world you need to deal with as well. So when you get into sea, which is about a 20, our operation with all this sea and air and ships and helicopters and fueling the rocket and boats back and forth. You get into kind of a psychotic state, you know, you're all stressed, you're excited, there's too much work, you didn't sleep. So, um, and obviously it didn't work. I was just pushing the button for like 10 times and nothing happened at all. But this, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is what happens when you deal with space. You need, to, you need to accept the statistics of working with this. And I don't think it's any different from amateur guys than it is for the pro guys, which normally use three to four times to get this thing going. But we will try again in June to get this uh, from the same spot in the Baltic Sea. Um, and right now we have a lot of time because we have this uh, rocket here, which is um, complete. We know what went wrong. We're fixing that. So now we have time to develop new stuff. Um, I just uh, finally want to make kind of a... A bad thing here. I think I'm going to get a lot of heat for certain people from doing this, but I want to compare it to something else. On your left here, you have the Mercury Redstone rocket, which the Americans used to send Alan Shepard in 1961 into space just a few weeks after Gagarin. It's the same kind of rocket. I looked into the detailed budget of this uh, from the NASA website and just picked out the thing for the rocket itself, the spacecraft, and the operation. It turned out it cost $400 million a year to do this. And I just want to compare with ourselves. We spend $60,000 doing the same thing. And I think that, you know, people might say to me, well, you can't compare this, but from where I'm standing here, it's the same ride, one person on a suborbital flight. There's no difference. So it's it kind of an interesting discussion to open out there, whoever sees this, you know, and if you're able to kind of, you know, take away that holy grail sphere that is on human spaceflight and kind of give it to everybody and say, well, if I want to do this enough, I can actually do this. So um, now I did it anyway. And uh, somebody will probably say the numbers is wrong. But, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's 1,000 the price or 110,000, which is basically is. But, you know, it, it's kind of you, you go from a government project, government finance project size thing to, you know, everybody can do it in their garage. Uh, well, final picture, uh, going back, no launch um, in September, but um, we are not going to give up even, you know, if I'm going to be 80 years old in a wheelchair, I'm going to push this button here because we need to get uh, ourselves into space and kind of, you know, invite more people to be a part of it from nowhere, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and that's it. I don't want to say anything else. So please enjoy, and if you want... <laughs> <laughs>